So now, as always, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucy Johnston. She's a consultant clinical psychologist, author of a number of books and publications, um, taking a critical perspective on psychiatric theory and practice. Um, she was lead author, along with Professor Mary Boyle of the Power Threat Meaning Framework 2018, um, a division of clinical psychology funded project to outline a conceptual alternative to psychiatric diagnosis. Lucy worked in adult mental health settings for many years and currently works as an independent trainer. She's co-founder of AD4E and an uh, all-round good egg. So here's Lucy. I've just got to do something with her computer so oh, and, turn my, and turn my volume off. So bear with me. Just going to take a minute or two to do those little tech adjustments. Um, so yeah. Oh, and it's really nice, Lucy and Joe. You're in the same location today, so it's lovely to have you together. And yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll put mine down. Okay. So you might hear just a little bit of echo as we sort out the audio and get the slides up. So please don't adjust your set, as you used to see on the television. Um, we'll have that settled in a moment. Uh, when the moment's right, we'll also get Lucy unmuted, I think, so that we've got your microphone and... I'm, I'm unmuted, yes, there's no echo, so now I only have to get my slides up, is that right? That's that's the next bit to do, yes. Um, yeah. Take a moment to do that. Hello everybody, it's lovely to be here and I'm the world's worst person at tech, even with Joe sitting next to me. I'm not convinced I can do it now. Can you see slides? Can you see it slides? looks great. Everything is perfect, Lucy. We can hear you. We can see your slides. So, that's, yeah, it's working well. Very surprising, but... <laughs> and I think I was going to give you a five-minute warning. Not, I don't think you're going to need it, Lucy, but no, I just... No, no. If that's all right with you, I'll interrupt you and... Just no, for, fine. For I, won't, I won't go over time. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Joe's just hastily leaving the room so we don't get some kind of horrible echo. Um, and lovely to be introduced to old faces and new faces. And we've started the festival already in, in two traditional ways, Joe's introduction and uh, Sunna's poem. The third thing we usually do at these events is do a brief overview of what the challenge to psychiatric diagnosis is about. Now, some of you will have heard at least a version of this before, so this is your second cup of tea moment if you want. For others, it may be new to you. I've tried to update it a little bit this year because since last year, um, the book that Joe referred to has actually come out in a second edition. Uh, the first edition was in 2014. There have been some interesting developments since 2014, some positive, some in my view, less so. But in essence, what the book says, and the message of the book is the message of the AD for e events. So if you want to get this already very cheap book at an even cheaper price, you can um, use the code, which I'm sure is about to be placed in the chat. It's accessible to everybody. You don't have to know anything about the area in order to, I hope, at least get a kind of handle on what are the problems with psychiatric diagnosis. So I'm now gonna whiz you through uh, what we see as the problems, and this is a way of setting the scene for the rest of the day, because everything else in the rest of the day will be building on these arguments. So as Joe says, we really want to emphasise, this is often misunderstood, but we really want to emphasise, of course, people's distress is very real. People can be extremely low in mood, have disabling panic attacks, be tormented by hostile voices, have terrifying mood swings and so on. Nobody doubts that for a minute question is how do we understand these very real and usually very distressing experiences? Are people suffering from medical illnesses which need diagnosing or do we need completely different ways of us understanding distress? That's the question. Key messages of the book and of the festival, actually in the world we live in very few people can afford to give up their diagnosis entirely. We live in a diagnostically dominated world you may well need your diagnosis, whatever you think of it, for access to benefits and services and so on. But you may decide, and many people have been to our events have decided, that you do not wish to define yourself and your problems in this way. That is up to you. And it seems to us that acceptance of a diagnosis should be on the basis of informed choice, not something imposed by a professional. 
And this is particularly important because although not everyone is aware of this, the authors of the diagnostic manuals are admitting that psychiatric diagnoses are not supported by evidence. So it doesn't seem right or fair to us that other people are forced to accept them, as is so often the case, and are not offered alternatives. If many mental health workers are openly questioning their diagnosis and saying we need a different and better system, service users and carers should be allowed to do so too. So that's our position. We are not, uh, not intending to go around the country tearing people's labels off them. We are intending to make sure that people are fully aware of the pros and cons and alternatives. So I'm now going to do the briefest possible summary of what are the problems with psychiatric diagnosis. And this starts by thinking just very little bit about the two diagnostic manuals. A lot of you will be familiar with this. All the many, many ways in which it is said that we can be mentally ill or mentally disordered are listed in great big thick manuals, one of which is called DSM and the other is called ICD. They are uh, very similar in effect. Um, uh, DSM is drawn up in America. ICD is used worldwide, but drawn up by the World Health Organization. And in these big manuals, you can find many, many, many ways in which you or other people around you or family or friends may meet the criteria for various mental disorders. So far, so good. But what is less widely admitted, and this knowledge doesn't filter down to many mental health professionals, let alone people who get labelled, is that the very people who drew up these diagnostic manuals are actually admitting in very blunt terms that they're not scientifically sound. So here is Dr. Alan Francis, the chair of the previous edition of DSM, DSM-4, saying it will radically and recklessly expand the boundaries of psychiatry. There is no reason to believe it is safe or scientifically sound. That's quite a damning statement. A former director of NIMH, which is the world's largest funding body for mental health research, says DSM is totally wrong, an absolute scientific nightmare. And Dr. Thomas Insull, an equally prestigious and uh, senior American psychiatrist, patients deserve better. Well, we agree about that. So the implications of this are absolutely profound. And whether or not the news has reached you, the news has reached at least some journals. And we're seeing a lot of this kind of headline. Western psychiatry is in crisis because of some simplistic and imposed application of reductionist science, which can encroach on basic human rights. From the British Medical Journal, very prestigious journal, psychiatry in crisis seems to have lost its way. And from Sammy Tamimi, who regularly presents at these events, it's time to reach beyond diagnostic dependence. So, we think the news should be more widely out there. That's partly what we're about. If we briefly have a think about why do we think we need psychiatric diagnosis in the first place? Well, in other branches or in, I would say, legitimate branches of medicine, you need a diagnosis to suggest what's the treatment, what's the outcome, what the cause is, so that professionals can talk to each other and talk to us about our problems or illnesses and to provide a basis for research. I would argue that psychiatric diagnosis performs all these tasks very, very poorly, if at all. But even more importantly, a reliable and valid classification system, in this case, a reliable and valid list of diagnoses or illnesses, is the foundation of any science. Reliable means that there's at least a pretty good chance that one person who is apparently diagnosed schizophrenia will agree with another person that this is in case of indeed a case of schizophrenia, rather than, as many research studies shows, it would be just as likely that they'll come up with another label. And valid means that what we are labeling people with actually does relate to something in the real world. These are not just ideas that we've invented in our heads. So if we haven't got this, we have to ask whether psychiatry is a legitimate branch of medicine, because any branch of science, and medicine is a branch of science, needs to be clear about its core categories, the atoms or the whatever else it is that makes up the particular body of science that we're thinking of. If we can't even say whether someone has this illness or that illness in psychiatry or whether or not they're entirely sane, 
with no problems at all, we have not got a legitimate branch of medicine. And psychiatrist Peter Bregin puts this very well, I think. Without diagnosis, psychiatry would become something very hard to justify or defend a medical specialty that doesn't do or treat medical illnesses. I think you can see that would be somewhat problematic, and I think that's the situation we're in. Dr. Alan Francis, who is an establishment psychiatrist, he's not actually against diagnosis, he just thinks we're going to produce better ones at some point in the future, admits there's no definition of a mental disorder, you just can't define it, it's bullshit. So, those of you who may have been given a diagnosis were probably not told at the same time that the person who presided over drawing up these manuals has also described these categories as bullshit. Okay, we look slightly more detailed, at look at some of these labels. Borderline personality disorder is, of course, a particularly toxic and stigmatizing label, which many people, even those who don't want to reject diagnosis, in totality think we should be dropping. How do we diagnose someone with so-called borderline personality disorder? You can see the criteria here. It's about apparently having unstable relationships, about being terrified of being abandoned. It's about feeling very bad and confused about yourself and so on. Now, all these are very real experiences and you know we may know people who could be described in this way. This may describe us at some points in our lives. But I think you can see that these are not what we usually think of as medical symptoms. They're not things like pains or rashes or abnormal blood counts, counts or things that show up on x-rays. They are examples of unusual and perhaps distressing ways of thinking, feeling and behaving. They are essentially judgments about how we think, feel and behave, not about what may have gone wrong with our bodies. And of course, there are reasons for the ways we think, feel, and behave. And many people have criticized BPD, and you know, along with every other diagnosis, there are many, many critiques. But in this particular case, it has been pointed out quite rightly that many people who end up with this label have experienced extreme trauma and abuse in their lives. Is it surprising that they feel confused, that they are finding it difficult to manage their relationships, that they are distrustful and angry? No, it isn't. Indeed, you could actually see these as appropriate ways of responding to what people have been through. What's happened to me, not what's wrong with me. So how do we actually decide who is so-called mentally ill? It's difficult. In fact, it's impossible because there's no absolute cutoff between so-called well and ill. All the criteria we're using are essentially subjective because we're not giving out psychiatric diagnosis on the basis of tests. You go to your doctor and say you're depressed. They don't give you a test of your serotonin levels and say, yes, you are or no, you aren't. We're essentially making subjective, ultimately socially and culturally based judgments about unusual or distressing ways of thinking, feeling, behaving. And as we've just heard, in fact, there is no evidence for the theories that we read a lot about, the biochemical imbalances, the genetic contributions. I haven't got time to go into it now, but um, we will be discussing, I'm sure, the explosion of the chemical imbalance myth very shortly. Along with it went a lot of psychiatry's credibility. So we're waiting for biomarkers, we're made, waiting for evidence that these experiences are best understood as medical illnesses, but as the chair of the DSM-5 committee said, we're still waiting. I think we're going to wait a very long time. So the summary of the criticisms of psychiatric diagnosis is that they're not what they claim to be. They're not based on what's going wrong in people's brains and bodies, they're based on social not medical judgments about disturbing or unacceptable ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. All the criteria are like that. Bizarre beliefs. How bizarre? Who decides what counts as a bizarre belief? What kind of judgments are we on criteria are we basing such um, statements on? So there is, on the other hand, a mountain of evidence that what we call mental illness is the result of a mixture of social, emotional, and relationship difficulties. We'll be hearing some of that evidence today. So we're left with a kind of circular arguments. In psychiatry, it goes like this. Why did this person have delusions or feel so low? Because they have schizophrenia or depression. How do you know they have schizophrenia or depression? Because they have delusions, feel so low. It sounds like an explanation. It's not. 
is simply a circular argument, it's a tautology. Whereas in general medicine, at least you know, a lot of the time, at least in principle, if you ask, for example, why did this person have headaches, you are able to carry tests to say whether or not the tests are perhaps due to a brain tumour or some other thing going wrong in your body. You can confirm or disconfirm a diagnosis. There is no confirmation or disconfirmation in an objective sense of a psychiatric diagnosis. The psychiatrist says, you've got it, you've got it. If they change their mind, you haven't got it anymore. And again, this is not just us saying this. Here is a report, a United Nations report from 2017, making some very bold statements about how we've been sold a myth that the best solutions for mental health challenges are medications and other med biomedical interventions. Not to say they have no role, but they are not the cure all. They are not the treatments for illnesses that we've been told they are. And this, uh, among other recommendations, this report makes the very bold one that we need to social target social determinants, what's going on in people's lives, and abandon the predominant medical model that seeks to cure individuals by targeting disorders. Very brave statement, made by a psychiatrist, incidentally. And mental health policy should address the power imbalance rather than the chemical imbalance. A brilliant phrase. Actually, I think it sums up a lot of the work of AD3, a lot of what we're saying, and what of many, a lot of what many other people are saying. It's worth mentioning, I think it's important to mention that, that the imposition of diagnostic categories, which are not scientifically based and which have some benefits in some circumstances, but have many disadvantages. Um, plays out even more unfortunately in non-Western cultures, both within and beyond the UK. There is a move, a, a movement called the Movement for Global Mental Health, which is about exporting our diagnostic model across the globe to low and middle income countries, which are said to be unfortunately not able to have access to our Western ways of putting people in boxes and giving them pills. Uh, this is despite the, the very uh, a very well established fact that recovery from what we might call uh, long term chronic mental illnesses is generally better in countries and cultures which don't have access to our modern West ways of thinking about it. Nevertheless, local healing beliefs and practices are being rapidly replaced by medication and drugs. Psychiatrists like Suman Fernando argue that this is simply another form of colonialism less obvious, but just as damaging as our earlier forms. Uh, Western psychiatry can certainly provide low and middle income countries with instructive examples, but they're mainly examples of what not to do. So we're in a kind of limbo state. This is an editorial from the um, journal, The New Scientist. Just over a year ago, this was written just before DSM-5 came, just after DSM-5 came out. So just over a year ago, that was 2013, the world's largest mental health research organization signaled its intent to tear up 60 years of psychiatry and start again. What this is referring to is setting up massive billion dollar projects called things like RDOC and HITOP, which you really don't need to know about, which are actually trying to rewrite the diagnostic manuals from scratch. Not many people know that, as the saying goes, it's that the um, best estimate is that these very ambitious and expensive and I think fundamentally misconceived projects will produce something useful in 10 or 20 years, maybe. In the meantime, we're left with, um, in essence, this is what happens when you push the argument, well, what are we doing with DSM and ICD then? Well, the answer is, well, it's the best we've got. And our belief in AD3 is very much that it's not the best we've got. There are many far more legitimate and helpful alternatives. But we are in a curious state, I think, and this is a relatively recent development, whereas the same time as critiques of psychiatry are slowly reaching the mainstream, more and more people are welcoming a psychiatric label. Counselors are reporting that people are coming along to counselling, particularly young people who've spent too much time on TikTok, uh, having labelled themselves and reporting that at last they feel OK about themselves and this makes sense to them. And nobody would want to take away the relief and the benefits that some people feel from a diagnosis, but I think it's very well worth thinking about 
what is this new trend about? What is this about, this apparent need to desperately seek a way of feeling okay about yourself by adopting a label which, to be honest, is not a scientifically valid one? And this trend is increasing rapidly. We are often told that one in four people are so-called mentally ill. In fact, the recent study from New Zealand showed that by the age of 45, nine in 10 of us will meet the criteria for at least one mental disorder. Uh, by the age of slightly older than that, it's surely going to be 10 in 10 of us. And then we reach curious pa paradox because when everyone is mentally ill, then nobody's mentally ill because a diagnosis of mental illness is based on a judgment that you're different from the norm, that in some ways, most of the world isn't expected to think, feel, or behave like this. But when everybody is think, thinking, feeling, behaving like that in one way or another, then automatically your experience becomes normal. Everybody's doing it, everybody's thinking, it, everybody's feeling it. One day when the final person meets the, criteria, meets the criteria for a psychiatric diagnosis, or probably several, overnight we'll all wake up mentally well. And perhaps at some point before that, it'd be nice if we started to think a bit more clearly and critically about how we're in this situation in the first place. Okay, the, these are difficult discussions. I, I think we want to acknowledge this. Part of the reason these are difficult discussions is because as a society, we seem to have very simplistic, very polarized way of thinking about, do, is a diagnostic label valid for me or not? It's very, this is a quote from my book, it is very hard to find a middle ground between you have a physical illness and therefore your distress is real and no one is to blame for it, and your difficulties are imaginary and or you're or someone else's fault and you ought to pull yourself together. Now, actually, those are two very limited options, and we need something better in between. But I think it's very understandable that if you feel uh, without a diagnosis, you are simply exposed to overwhelming feelings of guilt and self-blame and inadequacy, then of course you would prefer to say, well, it's a diagnosis, it's something wrong with my brain, say. But actually, we need something that takes us beyond what has been called the brain or blame trap. We need something in between. We need something that acknowledges that many of us are suffering, but we're doing so for good reasons and we are doing the very best we can. It's not our inadequacy, it's not our weakness, it's not our deficit. It's about doing the very best we can in, in a difficult world. And more broadly, we need to think about why we are all increasingly feel so desperate, inadequate and disconnected in the first place. What is it about our Western way of life? And it is particularly our Western way of life that seems to be driving so many of us crazy. Could it be something to do with this? And James Davis is shortly going to be exploring this theme in more detail, I'm sure. This is another quote from my book. Faced with the impossible messages, demands, and dilemmas of surviving within a neoliberal society, a diagnostic label may seem to offer exactly what has been stripped away. Acceptance, connection, meaning, and identity, along with relief from failure, self blame and inadequacy. Thousands of people testify on social media about their joy and relief at being validated, finding my tribe, and starting to embrace who I am. These are very real benefits, although sometimes temporary benefits, I think, but they're based on false concepts and ultimately have personal, social, and political costs. And here's a quote from one of our speakers today. When diagnostic tribes come to replace political tribes, our suffering has been politically defused. Okay. So our message today to repeat is that we need better ways of acknowledging and accepting our human struggles, our similarities and our differences. And we need to take a wider lens to understand why this is so hard, how we got here and what we might do instead. And this means looking at existing alternatives that are that always have been existing alternatives right back from the origins of society as we've known it. There were people saying these are understandable responses to people's lives, not mental illnesses. There have always been alternatives. We need to look at underlying assumptions and the context, and we need to think about new frameworks. And there's not going to be a single answer to this. I think there are many possible ways forward.
but I would argue what they all have in common, the one, at least the ones that are going in the direction that we need to be going in, is that they're not modifications of the diagnostic model, they are coming from a completely different position. So this is just a um, few thoughts, which will be familiar to many of you, I'm sure. So one of the um, increasingly widely adopted alternatives to the diagnostic model is the trauma-informed approach, which recognizes the very extensive body of evidence about the causal role of adversities of all kind, abuse, neglect, violence, discrimination, poverty, and so on. All of these events in people's lives particularly in people's early lives, increase the likelihood that you will later experience various forms of distress. Now that's at one level absolutely common sense. Anyone who's worked in services, anyone who's had any difficulties in their lives, which is all of us, will know that. Unfortunately, it sometimes seems to take an awful lot of research evidence to back up which of what is actually common sense. We do increasingly have the research evidence, which shows that Nearly all of the things we call in psychiatric terms symptoms are best understood as survival mechanisms. At the time, it, it was essential for us to dissociate or to feel panic so we could escape from difficult situations or whatever. These so-called symptoms can become problematic in their own right, of course, but they, they can outlive their usefulness. They were almost certainly essential and necessary at the time. We are dealing with people with problems, not patients with illnesses. Two of our very favorite books here, I'm sure Jackie Dillon will be talking about these later, Trauma and Recovery and The Body Keeps the Score, brilliant, brilliant introductions to the trauma-informed perspective. And as Joe's already mentioned, I and a number of other people have been involved in a very, very ambitious project to put all of these non-diagnostic approaches in a much, much bigger conceptual framework. Uh, it's a very big, ambitious piece of work. There is um, a PCCS book's introduction to it, which is a lot more accessible and easier to read, but that is the website if you want to find out more of it. It's a sign that we're ready for change, I think, and being ready for change is a theme we're going to return to at the end of the day that so many other countries, as well as across the UK, have expressed an interest in the power threat winning framework. So I'm going to wind up. I'm within time. You are. You don't need the, the <laughs> check in at five minutes, Lucy. It's great. Yeah. Uh, so I very rarely run over. So uh, Jackie Dillon is going to end the day today saying, instead of asking what is wrong with you, we need to ask what has happened to you. Instead of diagnosing people, we need to listen to their stories. A simple but radical message in the context of the dominance of the biomedical model emotional distress enjoy the festival great lovely to be here